<laughs> and so she's been a part of this church for a number of years, yeah, a couple yeah. of years, and, and uh, she lives here in the community, and she's, she teaches a, a spiritual gifts class here on Sunday mornings before church from 8.30 to 9.30, if anybody wants to learn more about sp- your spiritual gifts and whatnot, um, she teaches that. And so this morning, we thought it would be awesome to have her um, share on this topic uh, about finances. And so um, can I pray for you before we start? Absolutely. Father, thank you so much for Sean. Thank you for the gift uh, of teaching and leadership that you've given her. We pray, God, that you would use her in a powerful way this morning to uh, teach us from your word uh, what you say about how to uh, be a good steward and how to use the resources that you have given us um, to further your kingdom. And so thank you for her. We pray for your anointing on her. We pray you bless her as she brings the word to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, give it up one more time for Sean McFarland. Thank you, everyone. I am really excited to be here today. When um, Eric asked me if I would be interested in preaching, um, I said yes. And then he told me it was going to be on money, and I was super excited, which seems maybe a little odd because we don't really talk about money except for giving in the church. But over the past nine months, the Lord has been really teaching me a lot about money and what it means in the kingdom, and what it looks like to be responsible with money, uh, what it looks like our responsibility with money, and making money, and in giving to the kingdom. So when Eric said money, I thought, oh, this is great, because now I get to share a lot of what I've been learning, and to me that's exciting, because I think God really wants to do some things in his body, and a lot of that has to do with finances and kingdom finances and and really blessing his children with more so that we can bless others with more. So um, a little bit of information about money and the Bible, because I don't think people realize how much God talks about money in the Bible. So money is such an important topic in the Bible that it is the main subject of nearly half the parables that Jesus told. When you think about that. Money is the subject of nearly half of the parables that Jesus told. And yet, how often do we cover this subject? Um, One in every seven verses in the New Testament deals with the topic. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, fewer than 500 verses on faith, and 2,350 verses on money. Did you guys know this? I mean, that's pretty astounding. Okay, so the Bible is full of verses about money, which is, begs the questions, why? To me, I think really it's um, how we handle money, and, and we often talk about this, where we, where we spend our money is where our heart is, right? But I think there's also where we make our money, and how we make our money is where our heart is. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 16, if you want to turn to that. I'll give you a minute. I am going to be reading out of the uh, Passion Translation. Um, And so if you have the Bible app, it's in there. Uh, If you don't, they pretty much correlate the different versions. But this story is about um, the shrewd or dishonest money manager. So I'm going to start. Jesus taught his disciples using this story. There once was a very rich man who hired a manager to run his business and oversee all his wealth. But soon a rumor spread that the manager was wasting his master's money. So the master called him in and said, Is it true that you are mismanaging my estate? You need to provide me with a complete audit of everything you oversee for me. I have decided to dismiss you. So when I read that, I thought, okay, how are we like the dishonest money manager? How are we using the finances that God gave us? Are we mismanaging those funds? Personally, um, I've been doing a lot of growth in this. Last weekend I wasn't here. I was at a conference. And uh, the conference, the reason I went to the conference was for debt management. And I'm not in a huge amount of debt. I'm in a little bit of debt. I can get out of it, but I haven't. Why? Because I've been spending money to make me feel good. I've been spending money for my ego. 
because I want to have the best of this or the best of that, and I don't want to um, forego the luxuries and everything, but I'm in debt, if, and that's credit card debt. You know credit card debt, the one with 24% that you're paying, that if you pay just the monthly fee that's due, you might pay it off in 30 years and pay about 10 times the amount. I mean, that's crazy. That is being a bad money manager. And God was calling me out on that. It's like, how can I bless you with more if you're not faithful with little? And so because of this and being called out, and I love our Father because he does it lovingly, kindly, gently, and sometimes in your face, but it's all because he wants to what? He wants to give you more. He wants to teach you how to be faithful with the little so he can give you more. He wants to correct us so he can give us more. Because he knows that if we are open to the correction, then he can trust us with the more. And we'll do more of what he wants us to do. So, moving on. Chapter, or verse 3. The manager thought, now what am I going to do? I'm finished here. I can't hide what I've done, and I'm too proud to beg to get my job back. I have an idea that will secure my future. It will win me favor and secure friends who can take care of me and help me when I get fired. So the dishonest manager hatched his scheme. He went to everyone who owed his master money, and one by one he asked them, how much do you owe my master? One debtor owed $20,000, so he said to him, let me see your bill. Pay me now and we'll settle for 20% less. The clever manager scratched out the original amount owed and reduced it by 20%. And to another who owed $200,000, he said, pay me now and we'll reduce your bill by 50%. And the clever manager scratched out the original amount owed and reduced it by half. Now, one school of thought is that the money manager didn't receive a salary. And the way he made his money was by charging additional interest, like our credit card companies, perhaps. And that's how he made the money. And so... His solution was to go back to these people who owed the master money and to basically take off what he was charging them, the usury. So, and by that, he was creating favor for himself. And just like the tax collectors of that day, basically wiping out the debt that would have been paid him. So... When the master comes back and he says, basically, he commends him for this behavior. Now, he commends him for the shrewdness. So if indeed it was the case that he actually didn't, um, it was part of what he made and that's how he made his money, then I could see part of that commending. Like, hey, you know what? You did good. You didn't take off the top. You didn't take the top thing. But you were very shrewd and you went back and you made friends even if they didn't know that it was the percentage that you were charging, even if you didn't know this, you still behaved in a way that was very shrewd. So he didn't commend the behavior of being dishonest, but he did commend the money manager for being wise in the way he handled it in order to gain friends. So now going on to verse 16, 8. Even though his master was defrauded, when he found out about the shrewd way his manager had feathered his own nest, he congratulated the, the clever scoundrel for what he'd done to lay up for his future needs. So, laying on his deathbed, the rich, miserly old man calls to his long-suffering wife. This is his honor of Eric. I want to take all my money with me, he tells her. So promise me that you'll put it in the casket. After the man dies, his widow attends the memorial service with her best friend. Just before the undertaker closes the coffin, she places a small metal box inside. Her friend looks at her in horror. Surely, she says, you didn't put the money in there. I did, pro I did promise him that I would, the widow answers. So I got it all together, deposited every penny in my account, and wrote him a check. If he can cash it, he can spend it. <laughs> 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 
Jesus continued, and we're on the second part of uh, verse 8. Jesus continued, remember this, the sons of darkness are more shrewd than the sons of light in their interactions with others. It is important that you use the wealth of this world to demonstrate your friendship with God by winning friends and blessing others. Then, when the world fails and falls apart, your generosity will provide you with an eternal reward. I thought this was really interesting that really God's telling us that we need to use money to win friends. And I heard it said by a speaker, um, our dollars are like soldiers. And they go out to complete God's work. It's, it's God's army going out. It's really hard to feed poor if you don't have any money. It's really hard to help widows if you don't have any money. It's really hard to support churches if you don't have any money. It's really hard to do a lot of what the kingdom asks you to do if you don't have money. I mean, we have some incredible ministries and opportunities. We have people going to the Ukraine. We have people working down in Mexico. We, we have the church. We have Eric and Stacy who've really committed their lives. And without us going out and being responsible for not just how we give, but truly how we earn. Are we being responsible with the gifts and talents that God gave us to earn money, to earn kingdom wealth? I haven't been. I think I would ask God, like, give me an idea. Give me, I want one of those million dollar ideas that pop into people's heads and make me rich. I mean, who doesn't want one of those? Does anybody here want one of those? Yeah. So what if you got it? What would you do with it? Well, I, I got one years ago. And what I did is think, I can never do that. I don't know how to start my own business. I don't know how to run my own business. And I, what I said was, I don't have faith in me. But really what I was saying is, I don't have faith in you, God, to do this through me. Because is it about me anyway? I mean, it is that I have to be a willing vessel. But it's not about me as far as, as long as I am faithfully following him, it's up to him. He is the one, once I plant the seed, he makes it grow. If I have a male sheep and a boy sheep, I just put him in the same pen, but he's the one that makes everything else happen, right, and produces the animals. And so when we partner with God, then he makes it happen. But again, when we disqualify ourselves, we're saying, God, you're not a good enough partner for me. You're not going to be successful enough for me. You don't know what it's going to take for us to be successful that is not a good thing to say to God, because it's not true at all. He knows. You know, I think um, the way we handle our finances, you know, talking about money and why he talks so much about money, I think it is a huge lesson on faith. I think it points directly to our amount of faith with God. So... Several of you have heard my story as far as um, some of the challenges I've been through with being without a job. And uh, I bought my house, and 20 days after I moved into my house, uh, I was laid off of work. And I was out of work for eight months, and God was faithful. He provided my finances. It, it, it was miraculous and amazing. Um, but really what he said is, now that you have more to lose, do you still trust me? It was a matter of faith. It was a way to build faith, and it all had to do with money. I don't, do any of you guys have challenges with money and faith and really believing that God's going to come through? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know of anybody who doesn't. Really, when we're, when we're challenged, we're, I mean, I constantly hear myself and other people say, well, I can't afford that. I can't afford that. I can't afford that. Especially when he's calling us to do things that he asked us to do. The scripture says that he will provide everything we need in order to complete and do the good work that he's called us to. Now, maybe that is you are the missionary, but maybe that is that you are the business person who funds the missionary. Maybe it's the business ideas. 
I mean, not all of us are called to preach and teach. I, I enjoy it, but I do believe my calling is in the marketplace. I do believe my calling is to make money. I do believe my calling is to be wealthy. Now, wealthy, that, that's a whole other you know, subject as far as what does wealthy mean. I believe it means that you have enough to cover your expenses, that you are outside of debt, that you have reoccurring revenue that allows you to do anything that God wants you to do. And then enough left over to help other people do whatever God has called them to do. That is wealth. Wealth may look differently for someone who's ministering and called to Hollywood versus someone who is ministering and called to Mexico, Uganda, or different areas. But we are responsible with the gifts and talents that God gave us to produce wealth when that's our calling. I mean, this was new to me. And it's, again, about faith and increasing our faith as we step out and do that. Back to the word. Okay. In verse 10. The one who manages the little he has been given with faithfulness and integrity will be promoted and trusted with greater responsibilities. But those who cheat with the little that they have been given will not be considered trustworthy to receive more. So what does a good money manager look like? I mean, for me personally, I think it looks like somebody who doesn't have debt. Does anybody here have credit card debt? Okay. Um, grace on us. I was going to say shame, but no shame. Gra grace. grace on us, right? Grace on us to, um, to know God's will with that and to get it paid off. Uh, some of the things that I've decided to do, uh, I've gone through my expenses, and I've uh, cut a lot of different things. I encourage you to do that. It's, it's empowering. One of the things that God showed me is you really don't actually get that much joy or satisfaction over a lot of the things that you spend money on. Do you know what I love to spend money on? I mean, I've never done heroin or Coke or anything like that, but I would imagine... The way I feel when I give, when God has a divine appointment and I give that Holy Spirit high, it is like amazing. To me, I'm like, that must be why people get hooked to heroin. If this is how it feels, they could do it by giving instead. Wouldn't that be awesome? But those are the things that I love to do. I love to help people. It is. It is part of who I am. It is part of the way I'm made in God's image. But if I'm spending money on going out to dinner four or five times a night, or four or five times a night, that would be gluttony, uh, if I, four or five times a week, um, convenience things. So just the other day, we're making a run, and I'm thirsty, and uh, I was with my friend Kurt. Now, I normally would have gone over to the Starbucks right there, and I would have paid, what, three, four dollars for an iced tea. But I went home. Because now I have a different mindset. I went home. I'm like, I need to be a good steward with what God has given me. If I spend it all on myself for things that really, honestly, don't matter. I think that they do, but they don't. They don't matter in the scheme of things. You know, it's like, why do I need to have unlimited music from Amazon Prime? Why do I need to have unlimited, unlimited Kindle? My, my good friend Diana, she is, she's great at this. She's like, go to the public library. You can download books for free. I'm like, I love that. And my big thing, so I love wine. I've canceled my wine subscriptions. Why? Because I don't need them. They keep coming, and I, I don't need them, especially when I have debt. That is irresponsible of me. And so God is calling me to be responsible. Why not to take things away from me, which is what I always thought. He wants me to deny myself, deny myself. You know what he wants? He really wants me to give myself the things that bring the most pleasure, which is the things that line up with his heart. 
Because when we're a Christian, that's it. That's when we feel the most joy. That's when we feel the most peace. It's not when we're get, 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 get. It's when we give, 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 give. But we have to have something to give, right? All right. I was on a soapbox there for a while. Okay. Um, so, do you think it's God's will that we should be prosperous? And on that note, how many of you have been walking that out? Again, I, I bet that those people that raised their hand that wanted the great idea, I bet God's given you a great idea. I bet he's probably given you more than one. So uh, I want to encourage you after today. Oh, I didn't set my timer. Somebody's going to have to tell me where I'm at. Um, after today after the sermon today, I would like, I would love to have a group here at church that we get together and we encourage one another in our business ideas. Yep. That we, we, we should be doing this. We should be coming together and saying, you know what, we can build kingdom wealth right here in this church by encouraging one another. Because it's hard to do it alone. We're not supposed to do it alone. The body of Christ isn't just in this building on Sundays. And maybe that's an idea for a Bible study, like how, how to create kingdom wealth, but not create, but like how do we do business? Like one, two, three, I have been reading so many books on entrepreneurship and business and everything. I would love to share it with you guys. I would love for our church to be so wealthy and people go, what are they doing over there? And they come here just to figure out how to be wealthy because God is blessing us so much. Why? Because we're pursuing him. We're not pursuing money. We are not pursuing money. We are pursuing him. We are pursuing his riches. We are pursuing his wealth. Why? So we can do and partner with him in the areas that he wants to prosper everybody else. He wants to prosper us so we can prosper everybody else. All right. How much more time do I have? Huh? Oh, wow. That was super fast. Okay. Um, I have gotten through hardly any of it. Uh, so, <laughs> so just um, a few names of God. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. Uh, shalom. You know what shalom means? Yeah, but that's not all it means. It means wellness, completeness, wholeness, prosperity. Shalom means prosperity. When you say shalom, you bless people with prosperity. El Shaddai. All sufficient, more than enough, the God of infinite supply. So I think we touched on this a little bit, but why aren't we all wealthy? Honestly, I think it's a lack of faith. And again, wealth is, you know, relative. But I think it's a lack of faith. I'm saying that for myself. I think it is my lack of faith that I have not trusted him in the areas that he wants to grow and bless me. If you don't know God's will regarding prosperity, you won't have the faith to believe him for what he has paid for. So we know that he's paid for our sins. We know that he's paid for our healing. But he's also paid for our blessings and our financial blessings. So we're going to wrap this up with, we're going to go to verse 13. It is impossible for a person to serve two masters at the same time. You will be forced to love one and reject the other. One master will be despised and the other will have your loyal devotion. It is no different with God and the wealth of this world. You must enthusiastically love one and definitively reject the other. Now I'm going to go back to um, what it says. It is no different with God and the wealth of this world. In some of your Bibles it may say mammon, love of mammon. Um, mammon, and I just wanted to clarify this real quick. Uh, some people say that um, money is bad, the money of this world. Well, it is if you use it um, for worldly purposes uh, and if it's used by the world. But mammon is actually the name of a god and the god of money. And so the root of all evil is not money. The root of all evil is the love of money. So... I'm about out of time. Well, I am out of time. Um, I just want to encourage you again, two things. Um, this week, 
reflect on where you can cut spending so you can pay your debt off. What you don't want to do is keep paying other people, you know, 18, 20, 24, 26 percent interest. That is, that is not us being responsible with God has given us. Uh, if you guys would like to form a group and hold each other accountable, that would be awesome. I'm, I'm being, I, I have debt. I'm going to pay it off. I would love to, you know, do that with other people. Um, uh, I have a, a series also on, uh, war on, it's called War on Debt and how we can do it. I think that would be super exciting for us to be out of debt as a church. Um, the other thing is your ideas. You know, think about ideas. And then next week, let's talk about it and um, let's get together a group and see how we can create some real wealth in our church to bless other people. And then just where, where have you not had faith in God in concerning your finances? And, and what it would look like if you did have faith in those areas and what God might want to do with you. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, you guys are awesome.